Thank you, Ben. Very interesting. But you asked the question at, at the start, and I don't think you answered it. Is why are these ideas? Why why don't they die? This you know simplistic and oversimplified way of thinking. Uh, why are they reproduced? Uh, perhaps applying you know your complexity thinking to the institutions of development could provide an answer. I just want to pick up on a point that you, you made a couple of times, and that's about uh, the importance of political economy thinking as part of this thinking about complexity. Because this morning, I didn't get to ask the question, where is the political economy in, in a lot of the discussion we had about territorial approaches? I thought that was one of the, the missing parts of the story, and was wondering if you could perhaps speak to that a little bit more. Th thanks, and thanks, Ben. Very interesting. Um, I guess my question relates a little bit to the previous ones. And I mean, you've presented this as sort of a challenge about ways of thinking. And my question is, again, what about the politics of this? Because it seems when we, when we get into a world of essentially soundbite politics, what everybody's looking for is a very simple solution to something. So it's not that anybody believes that that's the way, but that's sort of the, the, the world of politics that we've got ourselves into. So what's the relationship between all of thinking about complexity and the reality of our current political systems, and how does that then flow into the accountability mechanisms we have, and is there a fundamental mismatch between public accountability for public funds and complexity thinking, and how do you tackle, tackle that, uh, that issue? Thanks. Let's take a fourth question. And Thank, then thanks, sir. That was an easy one for me to start <laughs> off with. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm Robin Bourgeois from the Global Forum on Agricultural Research. Um, what I was the like name, sorry? Uh, I'm from the Global Forum. So what was your name? Robin. Robin. Okay. Um, I, I, I would like to, s to know if you could elaborate a little bit on the link between your presentation of complexity thinking and uh, and foresight in the sense of uh, forward-looking anticipatory approach on the using participatory uh, um, processes and um, in particular to what extent works on territorial foresight can contribute to uh, territorial development. Great. Um, apologies, Julia. I thought, I thought I did answer the question about why these ideas don't die. I, I, think, I think that essentially that there is a there is a bureaucratic process, an individual process, a set of incentives that maintain these ideas. And it's ultimately about power and control. And it's very hard for us to let go of those in the context of international development. I think there are other areas of public policy where there's much, maybe this ties into Jim's question as well, where there's, there's much greater risk. We were talking in the break about the, the, the risk appetite of innovation in the public sector. The person that works out the silver bullet for that is going to become a very rich person. But actually, the, the way in which the public sector innovates, the way in which public sector adapts to a changing reality is, is a core question for public administration at the moment. And, I, and I, think, I think there are two ways of dealing with it. One way is to go into a huddle and say, essentially respond to this uh, request for simple answers to simple solutions, the kind of classic response. There was one senior manager in one donor agency that shall go unnamed who famously said, what we want are simple solutions to simple problems so we can demonstrate value for money. And that, I think, is going into a huddle. That's essentially saying there are, there are factors out there that are going to you know, go into a crouch and say, please don't hit me. I'll give you what you want. Or we can stand up and be a bit more politically courageous. And I, I, I think, actually, there's not enough political courage in the development sector to talk about the fact that sometimes things will fail. And that's part and parcel of, of the process. There are many other areas, and this may be, uh, I will come into your questions on the politics of complexity. There are many areas where we don't expect people to have the answer straight away, where it's actually legitimate to underwrite, use public funds in order to underwrite um, experimentation. Look at cancer research drugs. Lots of, lots of public subsidies of pharmaceutical companies in doing that kind of work. There's charity subsidies as well. Look at how we deal with um, issues like terrorism or ma uh, maternal health issues or youth unemployment. There's the, in, in many of these areas in, d in domestic politics, we accept that there's a need for uh, experimentation. And that's all really, I think, ultimately, the complexity approach suggests that we need to be able to experiment. We need to be able to, that doesn't mean wasting taxpayers' money. It means that going back to a taxpayer and saying, we did the thing we said we would in exactly the way that we said we would do it is actually a sign of failure. Mm. So the Austrian economics have got this kind of lovely, uh, the uh, economist school got this lovely kind of approach. They say you can either, when you have a goal, you can either specify your goal very clearly 
or, or the way in which you get there. But don't do both. If you do both, you, you're, you're doomed to failure. And what we try and do in development through the MDGs or the malaria campaigns or HIV AIDS, we try and specify both. And, and that's problematic. And that's dooming us, I think, to failure on a whole range of levels. So th the question then is, are we, we going to be more honest about that? Are we going to have a much more honest conversation about, about public accountability? Or are we going to carry on trying to uh, uh, sustain the illusion? Because if we sustain the illusion, the risk is that people just lose heart. And you know, in the UK recently, there were surveys which showed people care about global poverty, but they don't trust aid agencies to deliver on it. And, th and that's, that's a, that fundamental mismatch is something we're going to be seeing a lot more of, particularly as the compassion is no longer the monopoly of, of aid agencies. I think lots of people are getting in on the app, the private sector is getting in on the app, the communities themselves, there's kind of all kinds of grassroots movements like Kiva, which are about distributing funds to people, peer-to-peer -peer aid, essentially. So I think we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're facing a world where actually we may well become irrelevant if, unless we get on board with these, these more innovative approaches. Um, on PEA approaches, I think they're really important. I think there's a challenge both to, and I had the same question actually, John, um, where is the politics in a lot of this stuff? Because it seemed to assume that you have a territorial approach and everyone's going to kind of agree that on the things that need to be done and how it needs to be done. And that's, I know that's not what, I know Julio's work's got a kind of rich background to it, and there's a way about how you facilitate those social coalitions. But actually, their starting point, what they care about and how you make that happen, it's, it's not a technical process, it's a fundamentally political process. Anyone going away from this thinking territorial approaches are a, a new te technocratic uh, t uh, dream, uh, you know, you're going to be really disappointed. Uh, politics have to be baked in from the start, but I think there's a challenge to PA approaches as well. A lot of the PA I've seen has been ex-anti PA, where you say this is the political context right now, and then you come in at the end and say, okay, uh, as a result of our five-year programme, what's changed? And actually, you need PEA built all the way through the process. You need PEA to become like the equivalent, and that's what I was the point about action research. You need to be able to use that on an ongoing process so that the territorial approach is, is a, a genuine learning approach. And I don't think PEA scientists have kind of got on board with that quite yet. I could be wrong, but I don't think they quite have got on board with that, with that yet. Um, on foresight, I think it's a really important question. There's a, lot of, there's a big group on uh, foresight and complexity. In fact, there's a journal that's dedicated to exactly this issue. And I think foresight's really useful because it enables us to get on top of the dynamics, the unfolding dynamics, and using scenarios to challenge existing assumptions. And that's what foresight's most useful for. What, what we, what the, there are different elements of foresight, and some people see foresight as being predictions, saying what trends are going to unfold. But actually, where we can understand the system, we can use these kinds of approaches to, to get a better picture of the system and then ask people what might be in a given setting. And it could be a great way of kind of bringing the p political economy of different people's op options, you know, knitting the two questions together, to think about the political economy, think about people's options, think about what people want in a setting, and use foresight to uh, bring about the kind of imagined future in a particular country, in a particular territory, or so on. So I think it's got a really important role to play. As long as it isn't going down the route of prediction, but anticipation. The challenge is, prediction is cheap, but useless. Anticipation is expensive, but can be very, very useful. And, and if you're going to be serious about anticipation, you've got to invest in getting people together. And, you know, a, a foresight, uh, what I would love to see in response to your question is a foresight program that has poor farmers and policymakers in the same place talking about what the future should be of their territory. A second round of questions or comments? Yes, please. Thank you, Ben, for this thought-provoking presentation. I was just asking myself, uh, first putting myself in the shoes of people like us. We are here as converts, basically. Okay, we all want the same thing. Uh, so it's not difficult to convince each other. But then if you move on into polit politicians' uh, shoes, then what, where would it leave us as, a p as politicians? Because at the end of the day, you're facing these politicians who say, I have to make policies at the basis on the basis of inertia or power relationship or evidence. I think what we need to develop is evidence to uh, bring about policy change. <coughs> right? Now, with that in mind, I have a suggestion and uh, an observation and a suggestion. Observation is this, Ben, that uh, you refer to this, use this notion of a gardener not picking winners, etc. Maybe there a little uh, a, 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 a comment is that depending on the country and culture, 
it makes sense to pick winners. The Chinese, they all the time pick winners, but they have systems that are such that if the winner doesn't deliver, then they are out. So picking winners works in China, and China's scaling up approach is piloting based on winners that they have picked after observing them. We all have pilots that we do in China, but then you see two years later all over the place. So they pick winners, they pilot, they assess, and they roll it out because they have the system that goes with it. In other countries, it's more or less deliberate. In, uh, uh, um, in India, for example, or in Latin America, you see the kind of maybe uh, political uncertainty that you would see as referred to in, in, in um, Julio's presentation this morning. So that takes me to my uh, suggestion, which is this, that what would we get out of this, uh, let's say, theory of complexity if we say we have plenty of successful intervention, uh, similar to the one you presented with this morning, the second part. Those are like pebbles in the pond. Would it make sense to say, let's take those, okay, and we unbundle it until we find very simple models of intervention, and we systematically then ask ourselves, about drivers and spaces on how to get to scale. Thank you. Let's hear from Mauro. Thank you very much. I think I'm afraid that um, I completely share the uh, view of the need of uh, messages and, and reply to problems. Could not be further analysis investigation. But I honestly think that uh, to tackle the very stimulating question that you pose, we need to go back to something which is not in fashion today, which are the principle, not even of epistemology, but of uh, philosophy. I think these issues have been very well dealt by the Greeks and then by the, 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 the German, uh, especially Kant and Hegel, and I think we should refer to them. I'm very sorry. And bring <laughs> back the issue. No, well, I'm really serious. I'm extremely serious. Uh, and I, I, I think that the, 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 the all the drama of knowledge and doubt is uh, fundamental. You know, Kant clearly say 200 years ago has been developed, but you know, there is a certain knowledge for what we call scientific and what is not scientific. Like we cannot put the two, two things together. Today we want to simplify. You know, these issues has been raised, for example, by Foucault. You know, the, the, what, what is the, the relationship between the power and even our knowledge and uh, social attitude? If we f try, I mean, I'm, I'm a scientist and I'm a proud to be a scientist, but, you know, if we forget that there are other areas that cannot be matched, you know, by our, that's why I say not even epistemology can help, you know, by our explanatory models, which are very practical, you know, I, I, I think will be very difficult. So thank you very much for stimulating. Uh, if I can make a further comment, I will be very brief, and is about status quo. My, my reply to Jorge is obviously status quo. Also because if we think, for example, the hot spring paradigm, you know, has been lasting since 43, 42, has been influencing generation of training of, uh, of, uh, of uh, agronomist and, uh, uh, and so on, you know, and it, it is not only, is also the organization of services. So it's not easy. So welcome for what you say, but I think that you know, to move the status quo is not easy. Thank you. Thanks, Mara. We have a, a gentleman at the back. Yes. Thank you. Maybe this comment and question is a bit too down to earth or landing. Sorry for that. Uh, but may maybe regarding territorial development, uh, <laughs> what will make the difference compared to the previous approaches? I mean, do we have a, a long-term sustainable success stories? Uh, we know that one of the ingredients, it was mentioned this morning, is capacity. Maybe we didn't insist too much on governance and kind of joint commitments by all the groups, all the stakeholders in a given territory. I mean, these this are certainly important ingredients, but then because we are in a global donor platform meeting, I mean, how can donors and development partners contribute? And I mean, perhaps one of the contribution could be to, com to contain the complexity of aid architecture, which probably through many initiatives, I mean, tend to complexify or make it more uh, complicated. So, there perhaps some research or some studies to reflect on our role 
two, I mean, uh, this uh, territorial development and, and comparable approaches would be needed, and perhaps this could be a theme the Global Donor Platform could look at. Thank you. Thank you. Could you just tell us your name, please? Oh, sorry, Guy Evers from the Investment Center of EU. Thank you. We have a fourth question from Lynn Brown. Thanks, Sam. You've already done my intro for me. Ben, I found that absolutely fascinating. And in a sense, it's sort of so intuitively obvious. We all know this, um, although we carry on and do things in the same way. Um, and if I think back to Julio's presentation this morning, he outlined six critical areas for successful territorial development. And if you think of each of those, whichever territory you went to, they would be different. The way they lined up, the complexity of them would be different in all six, as well as the relationships between each one of the six. And yet, our sort of the way we do development tends to be develop a pilot, and then we do the pilot. And then, of course, whenever I've done this and I've tried to do, do a pilot, first of all, let's just say in a former organization of mine, if it wasn't 99% certain to work, I'm not even going to get it funded in the first place. So it's really not a pilot. And then the next question from any donor that might come in and fund it is, um, will you be able to scale it up and can you replicate it? And by default from your presentation, that is very depressing because complexity means that no, it can't be scaled up and no, it can't be replicated other than as broad principles because everything else will be different. So how do we actually change people's thinking on piloting, scaling up and replication, which are the fundamentals of how we work? Let me take that last one. I'll do, deal with them in reverse order, not least because my memory is failing me. Um, I think I think there's the, the, the actually that model, and actually it relates to what Jake was asking as well. You know, the, this way in which we can understand how things actually genuinely scale up. The reality is, having done studies of innovation, the narrative of that innovation around pilots and scale up and all the rest of it is often counterintuitive. It's not the thing that you think it's going to be. Like, I'll give you a great example of how M-Pesa was originally funded by DFID in, in Kenya and, and led to, has been a real success story in that country. And I think some ridiculous proportion of the Kenyan economy in terms of GDP goes through M-Pesa now. But it wasn't something that was anticipated by DFID at the outset. They didn't say, we're going to fund this. They, they had a set of principles that they were working with. And it was a relatively small investment, which m was working through B Vodafone. So it was kind of working through an organization that they had a relationship with and wanted to build a relationship with. And it led to a huge non-linear change. And there may well be some account somewhere that talks about the fact that that was piloted and all the rest of it, but that's not what actually happened. So a lot of the time, this kind of piloting narrative is something that we retrospectively apply to successes, and then we apply it to actual things that we're doing in the, we, we, we try and um, transfer that mass production model. The reality is we need to move away from uh, mass production. The alternative to that isn't kind of artisanal craftsmanship in policy processes. Actually, corporations are now dealing with mass customization. We can now think about how corporations can, at relatively low cost, deliver products and services that are tailored to specific context, specific needs. And we need to be bringing some of that thinking in as well. And that means saying yes to the piloting process, as Jake was talking about, doing operational research on successful in innovations, trying to understand that the pebbles in the pond, a lovely analogy, which I'll certainly steal, and, um, and, and actually trying to understand not just how they work, but also supporting in a territorial context how those innovations can be networked with each other, not, not uh, as a kind of sucking up the innovations, working out if they uh, are effective and then redeploying them somewhere else, but actually enabling people in different territories to learn from what's successful, because that's actually the route to navigating complexity, is learning how others have done it in other settings. Um, uh, th one of the areas that we've been uh, doing work on separately to this is with uh, in, uh, on innovation is, is in the humanitarian innovation space. So how do you innovate after disasters? And what you, what you need to very quickly realize in that setting is it's not just about making funds available. It's not just about having creative ideas, but it's about the capabilities to bring ideas to scale. And it's also about the, the inherent incentives to keep existing practices as they are. So if existing practices were subject to that 
that kind of 99% uh, um, certainty, they probably wouldn't be deployed. So why is it we are willing, and again, it comes back to this point, and it's a very human thing. It's not just in the development sector. If there's a factory that produces widgets, or widget 1.0, the minute someone comes up with widget 2.0, everyone who is invested in widget 1.0 is going to start rejecting it because there are all kinds of processes, technology, systems that are geared around widget 1.0 that support their career, their uh, their knowledge base, their professionalism, the institution and so on. So I think we need to, first of all, accept that this is a challenge that everyone faces. We should be able to learn from what others are doing. And I think, um, just to echo Jake, I think your solution about trying to understand the pebbles in the pond and, uh, if you like, to expand the metaphor, see how they can make a bigger ripple, I think that's exactly the way we should be going. Um, on the, the idea of actually understanding donors' roles in this, I think that'd be a great idea, specifically in context of the territorial approach. Because, uh, again, one of the things I've been hearing in the conversation is, well, territorial approach sounds great, but how do I spend money on it? Or how do I scale up my spend in this area? And that's one of the questions that I think people are, you know, when you go back to your political paymasters, what are you going to say? And I think actually uh, getting a, a reasonable understanding, uh, and maybe, you know, not use, you don't necessarily need to use the language of complexity to do this, but to say we need to think about networks, we need to think about context, is something that we can't deliver. It's, uh, it's got to be done through the national policy setting. And therefore, we need to understand how to position ourselves in the context of what is a really important innovation. And uh, one of the great things about being in a network like this is that you can invest some relatively small amounts of money and share the cost of doing that kind of research. I think that could be really powerful. So I think that's something that if I was in the Secretariat, I'd grab with both hands that suggestion. Um, on philosophy, well, this is my only joke about philosophy. I know Foucault about postmodernism. But, um, uh, but the reality is I think a lot, a lot of these ideas are... Um, uh, not necessarily new in terms of the principles that underpin them, but what we do have are new methods and new approaches. So I would venture that Hegel probably didn't have much to say about big data, uh, and Heidegger probably didn't have much to say about participatory approaches. And I'm, I'm, I'm just coming back to you and saying, yes, it's really important to draw on the, and remember where that comes from, from, a, from an intellectual perspective. When we're talking about actually practically doing things differently, there are people that are using these ideas in very tangible ways to ch inform policy. Um, and I think philosophy is really important. 